So I think we're started. Um, right, so so welcome everybody. Um, the graduate student uh, summer seminar here. Uh, just a couple of quick things before we get started. Um, just want to remind everyone that um, despite you know this being called a graduate student seminar, we have people from uh, you know various different backgrounds. Um, so I just like to ask people to you know be respectful of um, everyone else. Uh, that being said, please, please do ask questions in the spirit of a usual seminar. It's perhaps easiest if you just go ahead and uh, if you have a question, just unmute yourself and politely interrupt. Um, I think that's totally fine. Um, and if you if you don't want to um, say it out loud, you can always just type it in chat. And I'll try to keep an eye on that and uh, relay things to the speaker as they come up. Um, if you have a question that might involve um, sort of a longer, more detailed answer, perhaps easiest to hold it off until the end. We'll have a, a couple of minutes and you can ask uh, then. Um, and I think that is about it. So let me, uh, it's our great, great pleasure to have Neil Coleman with us, uh, who will be talking today about transitioning from academia to industry. So I'll turn it over to you, Neil. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the, the invitation. Um, let me get my slides shared. If you haven't seen them, they're in the uh, in the Zoom chat, but otherwise, um, I'm also going to throw them up on the screen here. We'll do the usual uh, Zoom uh, song and dance. Can you all see my screen? Is it looking good? All right, let me see if, if I start the presentation. Can you see the presentation, or are you seeing the uh, presentation mode? I am seeing just the slides or just the slide. All right. Okay. We'll just we'll just stick with the uh, the slide window here, so you get to see my presenter notes as well. All right. Uh, so I'm going to start with a little outline of what I'm going to talk about here. Uh, the first section is kind of my story, background on me, what kind of math I like, where I went to school, and uh, the kind of the decision process that led me out of academia uh, into industry. Second, I'll talk through my, my observations of academia and industry, uh, kind of comparing, contrasting the cultures, things that are good, things that are bad in each one, um, and just uh, share some of my, my observations and my thoughts about, uh, about the distinction having had a foot in both worlds. Uh, lastly, I'll, I'll focus on skills that are transferable from academia, from a, uh, from the PhD training um, that, that one gets in graduate school, uh, and which of those skills transfer over into industry, which, which of those skills uh, maybe don't transfer into industry, and then ways that you can frame your skill set to speak the language, language that is more common in industry. Uh, the, the bias here will be kind of the, the white collar tech industry because that's what I transitioned into. Um, I don't have experience in, in, in other industries, um, so I can't really speak too much to them. So uh, just be aware that, you know, if you transition to say, if you were thinking about transitioning to, I don't, aerospace design from, from mathematics or, or aerospace research or communications research, um, that there would be a, a different experience there, but that'll be one of the themes that that we have in this talk. All right, before I jump in, are there any initial questions? All right. Okay, so my story, I'll talk a little bit about me, who I am, uh, where I come from, uh, a little bit about the, the math that I like. This is a, a math seminar, so I, sh I feel like I should throw uh, some kind of uh, uh, some kind of mathematical theme in uh, my career so far. Uh, what I've when I transitioned into industry, when I've been doing since then, uh, and then I'll talk through kind of some of the various decisions uh, that I made and the considerations that affected my decision to to not pursue an academic job. So uh, my my academic resume is that I studied uh, math, physics, and economics as an undergrad uh, at Ball State University in Indiana. Uh, if any of you have heard of it. Uh, and then I went to Indiana University for graduate school. So I started in 2010. Um, Indiana has uh, required core math programs. So I taught each year uh, for, for undergrads. Um, and of course, I also could tutor on the side, uh, kind of uh, transitioned out of academia in 2015 to 16. So that's when I was job hunting, giving, gave a few job talks, 
uh, settled uh, to interviewing outside of, of academia and landed a job uh, at Allstate, the insurance company. Um, and then I, I completed my dissertation and I defended it the next year. Uh, so these days um, I'm a data scientist or engineer. Uh, I kind of live at the intersection of analytics and statistics uh, and software engineering. Uh, previously I was, uh, so I'm, I work currently at a startup called Dina. Uh, I'll share a little bit more about what we do in a little, in a couple slides. And before then I was a predictive modeler or a data scientist at Allstate. Again, that's the auto insurance company. Uh, kind of my, my personal life. Um, so I live near Chicago. Uh, if you were here a little bit earlier, I talked about uh, Northwestern and uh, the students coming back. So kind of one of the, the Northern suburbs of Chicago. Um, I have a couple kids, a uh, cat and a dog, um, you know, the, the, a nice, nice quiet life here and, and some of the hobbies that I like to do. I volunteer at the kids' school, so I'm like the, the kids' chess coach. Um, I like to play strategy games and uh, I do enjoy reading science fiction. Uh, if any of you haven't checked out our little science fiction bookshelf, which I realized after I was setting up is behind my right shoulder. Uh, the math I like. So in, in grad school, I, I specialized in uh, spectral geometry, or global harmonic analysis. So this is that, that famous paper by Katz, can one hear the shape of a drum? Uh, and the answer is, you know, if it's a 16 dimensional torus drum, no, um, that's I think due to Milner. Um, but if it's a convex, if it's a convex domain, the answer is actually unknown. Um, it was a, a result of uh, Gordon and Webb and Walpert in the early nineties uh, that, uh, that in fact, even planar domains, one can, there's, there's domains you can get by gluing triangles together uh, that, that actually have the same uh, spectrum. So this is the spectrum of the Laplace operator um, on, on a domain where you, you fix boundary conditions and kind of crank the functional analysis um, machine and you get out the fact that it's compactly resolved. So it has a discrete uh, set of um, eigenvalues of finite multiplicity that converge at infinity. And this sequence of numbers, these eigenvalues, is related to the geometry of the domain. Uh, so for example, the asymptotic expansion of that sequence, right? It's very difficult to compute an individual one, but kind of averaging it out in the, the large scale, one can see that the, its asymptotic growth is proportional to uh, a power function whose coefficient is the volume of the domain. And then you know, from there, you ask, start to ask other questions like, well, if, if they're isospectral, that is, they have the same sequence of eigenvalues and multiplicities, are they isometric? Answer, as I just said, is no. Um, there's other related questions like, uh, can one drum the shape of a here? That is, given a sequence of eigenvalues, can you find a Ramanian manifold whose sequence uh, is that, whose eigenvalues is that? Um, for any finite sequence, I believe the answer is yet. This is a, yes. Uh, this is a result of Colin de Verrier. Um, my dissertation in particular, I thought about a variety of questions before I settled on. Um, if you have two domains, uh, you're playing with words, can two drums the shape of a here? So I've, if I have two domains and I know something about their Laplace spectrum, so I know that the kth eigenvalue ordered with multiplicity is strictly less of one than the other, uh, what can I do deduce about their comparative geometries? Um, you know, it is a dissertation, so it's poorly written, and I don't recommend you look it up. It's embarrassing. Uh, the answer is eh, a little bit, not too much, uh, but en enough there to to write and defend. Uh, kind of during graduate school, I was adjacent to the low dimensional topology geometry group. Um, so hyperbolic geometry, um, planar geometry, Teichmuller things, moduli spaces, um, and and of course I needed to to learn some harmonic analysis as well. So classical PDEs. Um, heat traces, which kind of uh, the, the trace of the heat operator, the uh, of the heat kernel, um, the trace of the wave kernel. These are related to and give important techniques for understanding um, the spectral geometry or the global harmonic analysis of a domain. So this is kind of trying to to establish a little bit. I, I do know a little bit of math. Um, I, di I did go through grad school, even though that's not what this talk is about. You know, maybe maybe sometime I'll give a talk about about some of this math, but I'll pause here if there's if there's any mathematical questions about about what I've described here. All right, cool. Uh, so 
2015, um, kind of this is the highlights of my of my career so far. 2015, I went on a job hunt, started looking outside of academia, uh, landed a data science job at Allstate Insurance Company as a you know a very junior level data scientist, uh, working on telematics data to build insurance loss models. So an insurance loss model says if you have an insurance policy, based on what I know about you, how much should you be paying so that your um, expected loss, the expected payout on your accident, the accidents that you cause, um, is covered by the present value of your payments. Uh, so uh, the question was, so one of, one of the big things for insurance companies is always getting more data sources, better data sources to really improve the accuracy of those price models so that if somebody is truly very risky and you rate them as extra risky, but you have data that your competitors don't, your competitors say, um, oh, you're just fine, you're average, and then you turn out to be more risky and you cause them to have uh, the other insurance companies to have more losses, which means they have to raise their rates on everybody, which means more of those people will come over and uh, get more fair prices from uh, from your insurance company. So uh, that's that's the um, that's kind of what I was thinking about using telematics data specifically. So for example, if you have an app on your phone with a motion sensor in it, and we can detect if you're, say, uh, driving down the freeway at 90 miles an hour and swerving in and out of traffic. Turns out those people are more likely to cause accidents. Surprise. Um, so working on ways to bring that data in and use it to uh, really to make sure that, that people pay their fair share. Um, 2017, the next year, I kind of spun off into Arity, which was a wholly owned subsidiary of, of Allstate focused on, on the collection and processing of telematics data and then uh, turning that into data science products to sell. Uh, the 2018, I transitioned to Dina, my current uh, my current employer. Um, my role really expanded, managing a lot of analytics, uh, data warehouse, product data requirements. I was the the 18th employee in the company's entire history. Um, so there there was a lot there to pick up, um, a lot to be responsible for. Uh, kind of working on that many different fronts uh, for a couple of years. 2020, of course, you know. We all had a year, um, came out of it, and uh, 2021, we're scaling, um, growing, kind of continuing to, to build our, our product uh, products out at Dina. Uh, my experiences at Allstate Narity, uh, great experience, big corporations focused on really developing uh, new people, people without a lot of uh, business experience before from kind of the junior level up to the, the senior level. Um, and a great experience at Dean as well. It's a very different experience, uh, small, effective team, lots of hustling to, to close deals, um, to, to really support individual customer initiatives, uh, kind of identifying and prioritizing, you know, these five things can be fixed next month, but this has to be done now. And uh, a, a huge focus on building a strong product based on understanding patients and, and providers and what they need. A little bit about my current job, uh, Dina, um, the focus of our company is helping people age in their homes. Uh, we're a product company selling a software as a service product. So we're, we build software applications, a uh, big engineering team, a uh, big product team. Of course, lots of salespeople this year as well um, to really focus on expanding nationwide. Um, we, we offer transitions from inpatient care settings to the home, uh, collaborative management of episodes of care. You know, if you get a new hip at the hospital, um, and the, the hospital wants to make sure that you get the appropriate level of care and appropriate collaboration if your condition declines. You know, if your wound from the surgery gets infected, the hospital should know about that so they can help uh, direct care uh, to you that you need. Currently, a lot of health systems, there's no collaboration. If you get a new hip, the health system will fax you out to uh, fax out a bunch of referrals and you'll be accepted at uh, home health. Say a nurse shows up every week to your home or skilled nursing or rehab facility, and they won't talk after that. And then uh, if the hospital is on the hook often for uh, paying for any follow-up care that you need. So it's uh, good to make sure that that you get the appropriate level of care. So we have tools that enable this. Uh, we also have tools that enable outreach. So for example, if someone is diagnosed with COVID, um, you may, uh, the, the hospital may say, you're not severe right now. We're going to send you home with a pulse oximeter. And then we provide a tool that allows the hospital to send a text message every morning saying, hey, what is your pulse oximeter reading? 
And then if it drops below 95 or drops below 90, then a nurse gets an alert and uh, can then follow up and schedule. And uh, we've we've actually had, it, it's been really important and helpful. Uh, for example, we've we've saved uh, uh, people's lives according to at least according to uh, testimony from some of our customers. So uh, that's been been really helpful, and we've been focused on developing that this last year. And lastly, uh, kind of our data product, our insights. Uh, these are uh, data transfers, uh, reports, manage even that we provide to customers up to management by exception. So if at the start of a um, say again, you have a, a hip replacement. Um, at the start of uh, your home health care with the nurse visiting, the nurse will fill out a panel of, of questions for you about your, your status. And if something rings a bell um, or is, is statistically associated with a decline um, in condition, we want to be able to take that assessment data and alert the nurse and alert the um, other people who are collaborating on your care to make sure that you get the right amount of care. Um, so that, that, that's a little bit about our product line. Um, I don't mean this to be too much of an ad, but you know, if you do have uh, a connection, of course, reach out. Um, uh, we we are a very small startup. We just uh, um, I, I wear many hats here, so I'm the only data person. I manage our data warehouse, which is uh, an archive of all the data that we've seen in the past. Uh, I um, I'm our data engineer, so I write programs that get data from other places into our data warehouse where it's archived and stored appropriately. Um, I do data modeling, so I make sure that we're not missing data uh, that we need to store, that we're measuring the right quantities uh, in a useful way. Um, and I do statistical modeling um, to, to measure effectiveness and pred predictiveness of uh, input data to identify opportunities, return on investment, um, effectiveness of treatments, and so forth. Um, and, and I've also done uh, software engineering as well to, to build an application that productionalizes and operationalizes some of that those statistical models. Um, I've got a link to our website here if you want to go check us out. Uh, we are also hiring, you know, if you're especially if you're a good fit for a data engineer role, um, a, a senior data engineer role, let me know. Or if you know someone who is, please feel free to pass on our information. I'll pause here. Are there any questions about uh, what I do or what I've done? Cool. Uh, so a little bit about uh, the modeling yes, aspect. Please. Yes. So when, it's, uh, when, when you guys are, are say, predicting things, what, what kind of things um, show up as, as things you're predicting? Uh, so, so one thing, um, one example that we predict um, is rehospitalization. So again, to my, my example, if you get a new hip at a hospital, so a total joint replacement, um, and maybe you're on Medicare and Medicare pays for it. Um, you would, if you are rehospitalized, uh, that's a bad thing, right? It's bad because you had to go back to the hospital for whatever reason. Uh, it's bad because you didn't get the appropriate level of care in uh, in rehab or the hospital made a mistake. And for from the hospital's perspective, it's often bad as well um, because uh, Medicare will make them pay for it. Uh, so kind of all the incentives here are aligned to figure out who's going to rehospitalize, be you know go back to the hospital, and who's not. Um, and so one of the things that I do is, uh, in fact, one of my current projects is going through a bunch of uh, ass clinical assessment data, and identifying you know at time of discharge from hospital, here's their data, their the the clinical assessment, and uh, how will they. What will happen to them? Uh, were they rehospitalized or not? Are any of these extra predictive? So the the process here is, you know, there there's a literature review, a literature search, to kind of because this is an interesting research question as well, and then uh, a matter of seeing which of the literature's results can we reproduce in our data, uh, replicate in our excuse me, replicate right. Re reproduction is taking someone else's data and making sure that their experiment worked and their analysis worked. Replication is taking someone else's setup gathering your own data and uh, making sure that, that you are able to get the same results. So replicating the results on, on our data from, from the, the various customers that we work with and, and um, in our data warehouse. So it's uh, statistical modeling um, usually uh, de depends often 
not to get too far in the weeds, but often um, we're interested in interpretability because we're not replacing nurses, we're augmenting. We're helping uh, clinicians uh, with workflows to bring their expertise to bear on exceptions. And so the clinicians need to know, need, they need to know why an alert triggered and why, you know, why do we think that this patient is at extra risk? Is it for reasons the nurse has already internalized? Is it for reasons that the nurse was not yet not yet aware of? And so understanding clinical workflows and understanding um, understanding the data that goes into the model is is critically important to making sure that it's actionable and useful. So that was the spiel. Did I did I get your question there? Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So 2015, I'm a grad student in entering, uh, ending my fifth year. Uh, the renewal letter uh, was was much nicer from our our uh, depart our uh, grad chair, but it was effectively it's time to move out and get a job. Um, and so, uh, twenty fall twenty fifteen, um, I started started looking. Uh, uh, gave uh, a few job talks, kind of sussed out some opportunities for math jobs. And I, I also um, thought through kind of what, what would the different academic opportunities. So there, there's a research track where I get a postdoc somewhere in the world, then maybe I get another postdoc. And then I hopefully land a, a tenure track research job, uh, do a lot of publishing and some teaching and some service. Um, no job security for five, eight years until that the tenure packet goes in and then ah, tenure, right? The dream. Uh, there, there's also uh, t lots of teaching opportunities as well. Um, one of the, the experiences that I, I really didn't appreciate as a graduate student who was doing a lot of teaching was um, gatekeeping for other departments. Uh, that was uh, the, the business school at Indiana University. Um, one of the what required for students who weren't direct admits to get at least a B in the classes that I taught. Um, you know, and it wasn't just me teaching, right? These were big 80 person sections out of a class of maybe two or 3000 people each semester. Um, and I didn't think that was a great, uh, I, I got bitter about it. Uh, I'll, I'll be, be honest, I, it, it was uh, not conducive to students learning mathematics, appreciating the beauty of, of mathematics. Um, and I didn't appreciate being put in a position where, you know, I'm ultimately, you know, as, as much as we build process around it, ultimately it's my decision, you know, which students pass the course, which students fail. And uh, I didn't appreciate kind of being put in a position to, to gatekeep a lot of their other opportunities that I weren't related in my opinion to whether they were, uh, had really deeply absorbed the mathematics in the course. Um, and then, of course, it's it's often in these positions difficult to to have work life balance, right? Uh, to to paraphrase the old uh, engraving: eight hours of work, eight hours of grading, eight hours of sleep. Um, I, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, um, but the things that were important to me were stability. Um, so at, at the time, I had two young children. Um, now I have two medium sized children. Um, so I wanted to put down roots in a community. I wanted to have good work life balance you know, come home, be able to do things like volunteer at the kids' school, um, have family time with them. And I, I realized as I introspected, what was important about mathematics was to me um, and that I really enjoyed about it was kind of an intellectual playground, uh, a series of, of abstractions and concepts that I could think through and put together and understand. Um, but the the spectral geometry, the, the harmonic analysis that I did, as much as, as it was a... Um, as beautiful as it is, and as much as I enjoy it, that topic itself, that's, that subfield was not critically important to me. And then there were other considerations, you know, having, building a professional network. Um, there were other people at Indiana University uh, who had transitioned to academia. Um, of course, salary is, is a concern, consideration, providing for, for a family. Um, and I wanted to find a place where, you know, even if one job didn't work out, there would be others. Uh, you know, Chicago, the Chicago area um, is, is a big metropolis, the second biggest on this whole continent, right? The third on the, the continent. It's, uh, there's a lot of job opportunities here um, as opposed to a, a tenure track or a postdoc. You know, if, if something doesn't work out, <laughs> what else is there, right? It's a small market. So 
uh, the, these decision points and these considerations kind of really led me to focus on finding a job in industry, not in academia. Now, I, I, and to be, to be clear, um, in, in this presentation, I, I'm presenting my perspective um, and I'm, I'm presenting my experiences. And I, I, I don't want you to take this as a recipe or trying to persuade you away from a passion. Um, I think it's, it's important just that everybody uh, make a considered decision and this was the, these were the considerations in my decision. All right, that was a lot about me. Um, we're at about the halfway point here. So I think we're more or less on target. Uh, the next up is, next up I'm gonna talk about some of my observations having worked in academia uh, as a graduate student and having worked in um, industry as, as an individual contributor. Um, I'm gonna, give some descriptions of the academic job market, the non-academic job market, what career ladders often look like. Um, and then I'll compare and contrast kind of three interesting uh, aspects of, of the work and the work cultures, which are the pace of work, uh, the freedom of work and power dynamics in the workplace. Academic career tracks, I've talked through uh, tenure track jobs, research and teaching. Um, there's also, I want to uh, call out, there's also a, a large uh, contingent faculty um, track as well. And I'm, I mean, it's, it feels like a dead end, um, but it is, um, and, and I don't know that career is necessarily the right way of talking about it, um, but it, it is often uh, a, uh, a, a stream of work that, that people take on or are shunted into. Um, and, and if I were to choose to stay in academia, uh, this would be an option for the type of work that I would end up doing or that, that one an academic can end up doing, right? Semester to semester contracting, pay per class, um, kind of a second, second class within a department's faculty sometimes, depending on the department, um, you know, not necessarily part of department decision-making, not necessarily getting benefits, um, you know, socially, socially precarious, not, not integrated into the core of the department, the, the tenure track and, and tenured faculty. Industry, on the other hand, and speaking from my, my white collar uh, tech perspective, um, you know, there's a variety of, of roles that one can go into and adopt, and there's fluidity across roles as well. People can make career changes from engineering, one type of engineering to another, from IT to engineering, um, to user experience, to research and design um, and development. Uh, these are, this is kind of a, a quick summary. There's, there's engineering, which is focused on designing and building and maintaining systems. Uh, so there's software engineering, but I also want to call out in, there's also mechanical engineering, electrical engineering for the, um, in, in the, the non-software realm. I don't have a lot of experience with that. Most companies these days, almost all of them would have an IT department. Uh, focused on uh, managing technology for across the enterprise, as well as uh, um, particularly the the area that I'm most familiar with, uh, shaping and storing data, uh, building reports, generating value from that stored data uh, for the rest of the the company. There's uh, user experience design, so individuals whose whose whole focus is graphic design, um, optimizing the experience of people as they interact with with the company, whether through an application interface. Um, or through advertising. Um, there's also technical research and design. So identifying potential product opportunities, e doing even more baseline research, performing experiments to confirm, um, feeding into engineering um, and designs to build. There's also, I'm gonna call it two other potential tracks. Uh, from the bottom up, there's contract work. So um, people can build careers as contractors. Um, often generally contractors are brought on similar to how you might ha uh, hire a contractor for fixing a, uh, building a, a, a new addition to a house, for example, or coming in and doing a single job, taking a tree down, fixing, uh, fixing um, plumbing in the bathroom. Um, a contractor is brought on to perform a single job, you know, stand up a data warehouse, right? Um, but write me a report on this particular thing. Um, do an analysis that predicts this particular outcome. Um, so contract work is out there often. It doesn't come with benefits, but it's often 
more lucrative on an hourly basis than than uh, kind of the technical white color uh, track where one embeds inside of an organization and, and performs a role within the organization. Um, although sometimes uh, contractors are brought in as and this this is my opinion is this is an unhealthy organizational design, but sometimes a, a company will bring in contractors and embed them on teams and expect them to perform almost as uh, as uh, the the full-time employees. Um, but this then creates a kind of a, a tiered class system within the workplace that I don't I don't believe is healthy. Um, and lastly, there's management, which is recognized generally as a separate career track from the technical tracks or these individual contributor tracks. Um, so it's a different set of skills, um, kind of functioning as connective tissue within the organization, determining priorities, trying to identify what's the best way to organize um, the different roles and the different teams within, within the company to produce, um, planning out projects, executing the projects, uh, helping work proceed, and making sure that people are talking to the right other people. Um, knocking down people's doors you know if, if our if our VP of engineering needs to review a design and as a week overdue the project manager will um, bug him until he does it right so different flavors there's people managers whose job is to uh, make sure that that people feel feel safe uh, feel heard have opportunities to grow their careers uh, there's product managers whose role is to make decisions and priorities about uh, what a product should be there's project managers whose role is to really lay out all of the individual tasks and make sure that everything is sequenced right, happening on time. So management, I think, is is and should be considered a, a different set of skills than individual contributing. And we'll, we'll revisit that theme here in a couple of minutes. This is a lot. Um, I know I'm, I'm talking a mile a minute, and my slides are mostly text. So I'm going to pause here again for uh, some more questions. All right. Well, let's keep going then. So just to get a sense of the job markets here, um, I went on math jobs this morning. And I looked at how many jobs were listed in the US. And here they are. There's 266. And then I went on the website Glassdoor. And there are 7,193 listed on Glassdoor. But these are not just any jobs. These are the full-time jobs that were posted last week. So I want to be clear, uh, the, the scale, we're talking many orders of magnitude. This is everything that's posted currently on math jobs versus all the stuff that was just posted in the last seven days on Glassdoor, 7,193. So this is something to keep in mind. And I think it, it's, it, it was an adjustment for me coming out of academia where you're as one specializes, you're integrating into a very specific research conversation, right? I could list out on on you know there, there's probably ten or fifteen people in the world who are in in global harmonic analysis. Um, I know them. Um, even if they don't know me, they know know my advisor. Um, you know, I'm contributing, and it's a very small village. Uh, any any contribution that I make in the in in my field is uh, is a contribution to a conversation with maybe 15, 20 people, right? That's that scale, the scale where there's 266 jobs in the market, some are postdocs, they're probably all scattered across all the different fields of mathematics to 7,200 jobs listed in the last week alone uh, on just one job posting site. Right? There's many other job posting sites. Some companies won't use this. It's just a, a completely different level of scale. And I think that's important to bear in mind when thinking about academia versus industry. Um, also notice the, the salary range. Of course, there's a lot of uh, variation in salary, right? 55,000 in Chicago is very different from 55 in um, San Francisco. Um, but notice that 55 is at the bottom of this range, 55 up to 150. Of course, this is at all levels, right, from junior to senior. Um, 
but even starting out, it's it's comparing to it's comparing well to uh, faculty tenure track jobs. Okay, so having having seen the scale of the difference here between the two uh, between the two um, professions here, I'm going to talk through kind of three cultural differences that I've noticed. Uh, the first that I want to address is the pace of work. So in academia, projects can take months or years, right? Uh, how long did I spend writing my dissertation? I don't even want to think about it, but it was, it was quite a while. Um, in industry, it depends heavily on the organization uh, that, that you're working for. The smaller the organization, the shorter the time horizon. So uh, most of the work that I pick up, uh, the projects are measured in hours or days. Um, the longest uh, the longest project that I worked on that, uh, frankly, uh, should not have taken that long was a couple of months. So the largest organizations will have the the capital to support and the, the time horizon to support um, deep research. Um, and those organizations, projects can take months or years. So for example, if you're doing research for a pharmaceutical organization, maybe you're developing an mRNA vaccine, right? That, that level of basic research can take years, right? They, they worked on the mRNA vaccination since the 80s, um, I think, from when it was published. And often uh, in those large organizations with those research labs, there's a lot of collaboration with academia and academics. Um, in academia, collaboration does go back and forth. Um, often it's very little structured. Often it's, uh, especially in mathematics, it's with the, the individuals, you know, other people in your field, in your subfield. Um, it's very informal, uh, very, uh, very um, up to negotiation, individual negotiation, not, not a formal negotiation, but like, hey, how do you want to, you know, should we meet every week? Okay, yeah, that sounds good. I'll send out a Zoom, right? Um, in industry, however, the whole purpose of a firm is to collaborate. Um, the whole purpose of a firm is so that we can, is that a group of people can come together and work very closely together intensely uh, to, to build something and to ship it out and create value. Um, so there's a lot of communication. It's much more structured, uh, especially in these, these white collar in the tech industry. There's a lot, of, a lot of structure around process to make sure that we're not wasting each other's time. You know, we're, we're communicating the right things to the right people. Um, so there, there's a lot of communication um, between, to manage expectations. Um, it's, it's very structured. It's, it's very different from collaboration in the academic sense. Um, and lastly, the amount that you should think before asking questions, right? Um, math, you know, if you have a question for your advisor, maybe you go and think about it for a week and then you come back and you ask it and you think about it for another week. You come back and you, or maybe you think about it for a month and then you ask. Um, there, there's often, um, you know, a set of status signals. Uh, I, people not, not wanting to, to ask a question in seminar because it makes them look dumb, right? There's asking a dumb question can maybe feels like a status demotion. Um, whereas in academia, in, in industry, excuse me, uh, you're supposed to think a little bit and then ask. The pace of delivery is so much faster. You shouldn't think more than an hour or two, right? Although I'm sure the culture will vary considerably between organizations. Um, but on that note, organiza uh, in industry, organizations are often very uh, self-aware about their culture and what they're trying to create. Uh, and I don't think that academia, um, in academia, there's a lot of introspection about the culture that um, is being created and shepherded in a department. Um, there, there's a story that I that I heard once. Uh, Facebook was staffing up with a bunch of uh, grad students or people with PhDs right out of graduate school, um, and and uh, a manager said to the team, you know, hey, if you don't get it right away, don't ask me. Think about it first, and then come ask me if you've thought about it. Uh, and the manager, nobody asked the manager any questions for the next week. And after, you know, in the next team meeting, the manager says, I told you guys to ask me after, after you thought about it. But it turned out the manager meant, go think about it for 30 minutes and then ask me. But the grad students heard, think about it for a month and then ask me. So it's that, that level setting on, on pace that, that it's, it's very different. Um, that was one of the big things that I, I, frankly, I struggled with coming out of academia. Um, freedom. There's a lot of freedom in academia, right? It's the dream, full research freedom, uh, no formal constraints on your research direction, although it's driven by fashion. If you're writing stuff that nobody cares about, you're not going to get citations, you're not going to get published. Um, it's a tiny market, 
in the sense that you own your own research, you own it as a product. Uh, so that in itself constrains um, constrains your uh, research. It's also a tiny job market, as we discussed, right? 200, 300 jobs in the whole US for, uh, for math jobs. Um, industry, on the other hand, uh, the focus is on providing value. So the, the company has customers. The focus of the company is to provide value for those customers so they continue to buy your products, right? They continue to buy your services. So there's many formal constraints on research direction, on the direction of your thoughts. Now, I mean, there, it's not thought police, but the things that you spend your time thinking about and doing um, are heavily constrained because often um, it's because it is driven by perceived customer needs. Uh, the, the difference, uh, this is very similar actually to mathematics because you know, there's no formal constraints on your research, but what you spend your time thinking about is driven by the needs needs of your customers. In other words, the people who will be reading and potentially citing your papers, right? You want to find a problem. This is a fundamental skill, right? To find a problem that uh, is solvable and also interesting. Um, the difference is that this is an internal constraint, right? You have to be aware of your market. You're performing the function of a whole product team and also the, all of the um, technicians on that product team. Whereas in industry, because it's a group of people collaborating to produce things of value, this has to be, um, the, these controls are controls are external. And when I say controls, I don't mean um, you know, formal control. It's more uh, being able to defend how you spent your time and defend that it was, uh, that it was based on customer needs. Um, lastly, in academia, as we know, work-life balance can be difficult. Um, whereas in industry, there's a huge variation in work-life balance um, from organization to organization. Some, you know, you read about Netflix, they they chew up their their teams and and spit them out, right? They, they're very intentional about creating a culture where um, people are willing to prioritize work over everything else. You know, whereas the company I work for, Dina, um, you know, we, we have a lot of work and we have, it's very urgent work, but it's it's very focused on creating a healthy workplace for people to work and also have families and lives. Um, and that's that's a very intentional decision by our leadership as well. So again, to organizations being self-aware about their, their culture. Um, I should note that uh, these constraints on research direction, um, as you grow in, in a career and, um, become more aware of the big product in the big picture in the organization and the products and the market and build trust with stakeholders. So the people that consume the output of your work, um, you are trusted to become more autonomous and um, kind of the mode of communication with the rest of the organizations, which is from defending things that you think about to uh, identifying the value you created and marketing it. So I do want to, to call that out that um, this is kind of from the, the junior to the senior contribution level. And there will be a similar journey, um, I would imagine, in academia as well. Lastly, I want to talk about power dynamics. Um, I have a lot to say about this, so I'm going to be relatively brief. Um, you can see I have lots to say. Um, the, the key thing, is, key differences are that industry is hierarchical. Um, organizations do have org charts, right? I have a manager whom I report to. My manager has an executive that they report to. Um, you know, the executive has to, is accountable to the executive team, is accountable to the board of directors of our organization. Um, being hierarchical in this way comes with being self-aware. As I said earlier, management is recognized as an entirely separate career track. If I transition to management, it's not, I'm, I'm moving from, I'm effectively, you know, a senior, I'm a, I'm a team lead, a tech lead. Um, I would be moving to a an entry level position as a first year, as a first time manager. Um, so being hierarchical and self-aware about it means that organizations, um, you know, there's can, uh, can formalize how they engage with power and power dynamics. Um, I would add that the size of the market means that um, if an organization goes bad, if it goes sour, uh, if there's abuse, and to be frank, there is abuse, um, you know, there's, it's, the industry is full of people and people will abuse power. Um, the fact that there are many other opportunities, 
uh, means that people can means that people can uh, go away from an organization. And if an organization as a whole goes sour, often people will leave and it will shrivel and die. Um, so that that's that's very different from academia, where and if an organ a department's culture goes bad, um, it is a much more difficult process to leave. Um, and I think that's that's a huge check on um, on power dynamics and uh, and abuse. Um, and uh, I'll get to your your question, YT, in in a moment here. But I, I want to also point out that power and it's not directly addressed as power, uh, but leadership and management training, all of these buzzwords are about um, the appropriate and useful wielding of power. Uh, you know, you can get an entire degree in it. That's what an MBA is about. Um, there's books written about this. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that what I'm speaking about is my experience is white collar labor, where individual contributors are often hired into managerial positions. People leave managerial positions to go back to being individual contributors. It's very fluid. There's no formalized dynamic. It would be very different. Um, it, it, so the, the distinction between you know, an Amazon warehouse worker and a computer coder, a software engineer, very, very different dynamics at play there. So this is speaking specifically to power dynamics in white collar um, in the tech industry. Uh, YT, your question, which sector you think is more meritocratic and which more political that is, relations, alliances matter for promotion, assignments, et cetera, academia or industry? It's a good question. Um, frankly, I think industry is more merit meritocratic. Um, in academia, you have to be, oh, it's, it's hard to say. Um, yeah, I, I would say that industry is more meritocratic. Um, I think in academia, merit does play a, a role. You know, if if you're up for promotion in a research-oriented job, you have to have produced good work, right, or at least gotten published. Um, and and I would say that in industry, there is absolute, there are absolutely politics. That is, you know, working relationships, um, you know, formal informal alliances. Um, although I think that matters more at larger organizations, um, and for the uh, for individuals in in that managerial role who have kind of specialized in that work uh, because managing relationships uh, is work um, and, and it has to it has to occur. Um, I, I would say that organizations um, in industry that don't produce value for their customers, they don't make money, they go out of business, right? Um, so th there is that Darwinian check. It's much, much more removed um, in academia where a department is really a small piece of a much larger uh, corporation. Um, I think in, in industry, it's also easier to be shielded from, um, from these politics, uh, by choice or by, um, by fact, by focusing on doing good work and managing a relationship, just one relationship with a manager, instead of needing as a manager to really manage a lot of relationships, um, across the organization. Um, I know that was a little bit of a rambling answer, but I, I, I hope it I hope it helped a little bit. And I, I should probably uh, focus these thoughts and and write up uh, a, a medium essay or something. I would say that that academia also has um, I don't think is very intentional in its approach to working relationships. And I think industry, at least um, it is much more intentional in its approach to working relationships and building those. So I have a lot more to say about power, but um, we, we have uh, five minutes or so left. So I'll move on to the next section here, which is transferable skills. So that's selling yourself, uh, framing, framing uh, your skills in a way that makes sense to people who are not academics, and then things to focus on. Um, so I'm gonna talk very quickly about what you learned in grad school, um, selling yourself, that is uh, being able to promote yourself uh, to people in industry, um, and then ways to frame it, uh, frame your skills that make sense uh, to uh, what somebody in industry would be looking for. So selling yourself, basically don't be shy, make a lot of friends, um, uh, 
you know, one, one particular uh, piece of good luck that happened to me was I, I became friends with a lot of the people in, in my department who ended up getting master's degrees and going back right into industry, um, some of them who had come out of it. Uh, and that that ultimately, if I trace back, you know, the the network of professional relationships that led to my becoming aware of Allstate as a data science job opportunity, um, that kind of, it traces back to that. So become friends with the master's students in your department, you know, figure out where they came from, where they're going to go. Um, and one one other piece of selling yourself, uh, hiring managers, if, if someone is, is looking to hire, they're looking for how are you going to add value to the organization? So it's the same skill that you flex when you write a paper. Why do you care what I'm doing? Why do you care what I'm doing? You know, what, who cares about whether you can hear the shape of a drum? Um, flex that skill uh, when you're thinking about making a job. Skills that you develop as you get your PhD, things that are recognized. You've mastered your field. You've mastered your subfield. You can take uh, a research question, break it down, solve it, write a paper about it, publish that paper. Right? You know who did what in the history of your field. You know uh, the other people in your subfield. You know what pa what journals um, to go to to find answers to your questions, who to ask. Things that are not recognized that are fundamental uh, skills. Finding questions. Which questions are interesting or valuable to the rest of your subfield? What's probably true? Being able to evaluate a proposition as this might be a theorem, this might be true, or that's probably not. And here's where I'd look to find a counterexample for that. What's easy to prove? You know, knowing from the experience of trying and failing to prove something that, oh, that's an intractable problem, right? Versus, you know, I can take this one, I can take this problem, it'd probably take me a week to solve this. That's a critical piece of, that's a critical skill. Um, Self-motivated project management. You can take a, a paper, say, I'm gonna write this paper, break the, this down into a series of homework problems, essentially, and then solve each of those homework problems and wrap it all back up and present it back as a, as a research paper. Lastly, communication. Here's what we did. Here's how we did it. Here's the research program. Here's where this fits in that research program. I proved these two theorems supported by these lemmas. Here's how that paper breaks down. Lastly, um, and this I think is, is deeply underappreciated, is that PhDs learn, they know how to learn. You know what it's like to be confused and to push through that confusion knowing that at the end of it, you will have more understanding. And that's a, that's a critical thing that I think is deeply underappreciated um, about a, a PhD. So knowing what it's like to be an expert and what it's like to become an expert in something. Uh, some, some practice here, research career tracks. Uh, see, talk to people who are in those career tracks. Uh, be aware when you're exercising some of those unrecognized skills and then learn the new things that you need to learn for that career track. So it's it's a career change, um, but being able to frame yourself as having a foundation that you can build on is is critical. So, you know, for example, don't list your papers. Instead, say you're a peer-reviewed scientific communicator. Right? You know how to communicate. That's the skill. The skill is not the papers. The papers are supporting supporting evidence. You know, instead of saying I proved a theorem about this, say that. You broke the theorem down into its pieces. You said each of these is going to take this long, and then you pushed it all the way through. Instead of saying, you know, my specialization is global harmonic analysis, it's I, I have a proven ability to quickly learn deep technical concepts, and I know how to use the research literature. I know, and I'm taking those skills and putting them to the test right today, even. Um, instead of teaching, right, you're a proven technical communicator. So it's it's a very, to a non technical audience. And, you know that's one of the strong skills that I, I brought non-technical skills coming out of, uh, out of graduate school at IU where I taught every year was the ability to, teach to take something technical and break it down for an audience who's not technical, so kind of think about framing from the perspective of someone who's not impressed with academic achievement but is impressed by, the skills that you've built especially those non-recognized skills. All right, well, it's three o'clock. We've talked about everything. Um, this is <laughs> this is uh, the the end of my talk. So here's a fin or two fins rather. Um, here's a little outline of what we talked about. Um, I will put this in the chat again. Um, specifically the uh, the document here. 
um, that of with the spreadsheet. This should be a link where you can go in and view it. Um, in fact, uh, the AMS supports career transitions like this and is trying to build out kind of a pipeline from from academia to industry and to support people who are making that transition. I know that culturally it's not it's it's a struggle in mathematics, um, but here are some resources uh, that that you can use. Um, also, feel free to reach out to me as well, um, and I'll, I'll I can uh, be a resource as well uh, or try to help you find other people who would be uh, interested in talking if you have more questions about this. I have uh, 20 minutes or so that I can stick around and answer questions if the if the Zoom will be up. Um, so thank you for, it's not a TED talk, but thanks for uh, coming to my talk and I, I hope it, you found it informative. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's give you a round of applause. It was a wonderful talk, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Applause is so depressing in a Zoom talk. Yeah, yeah. We have our, our all hands company meetings on on uh, Fridays, and you know, we, we have what um, we we have kind of an internal recognition for someone who is extra helpful that week, and every week they get it, and then you know, it's it's exactly like like you did, like two or three people will unmute and, and applaud like you did, Kim, which I appreciate. Uh, but it's it's kind of a running joke in the company now. I see a question in the chat here uh, from from you, Kim. Uh, yeah, it's so there, there is a, a different language. Um, this is not the slide. Where was it? Uh, it's a it's a different language, um, to and a different zeitgeist for thinking about it. Uh, the the framing here is so and and I apologize for for slipping into the the jargon. Uh, the the critical thing is that uh, when you put a, an achievement on an academic CV or resume, right? It's a concrete output, a result, which signals that you have skills. Um, in industry, you know, for the further a job is from basic R&D, the less they care about um, the specific academic achievements. Uh, and so, I, and it's, I mean, it's true. I, a PhD, you know, it's a great credential. It, it looks awesome. You know, it, it, it does open doors by itself. Um, just by virtue of having it, the the status of it, but you know, people don't really care that I know a lot about you know functional analysis, right? So um, instead of the achievement, which means something to an academic, uh, focus on the skills that led to that achievement, which communicate potential to a non-academic. So that's what I'm trying to get at with this: is that instead of the achievement communicate the skills that you use to get to that achievement, because those skills are what's transferable from academia to industry. Does that make more sense? Yeah, I think what uh, keeps catching me up is that these phrases that you use, to me as well as an academic, they sound like there is no content, like there's no piece actually in there that shows that the person saying this in any way has what they're saying. It sounds like marketing speak. That makes sense. The So here, here's one way, potential way around that. So first of all, it is marketing speech, right? You're marketing yourself, but, um, and, and most companies, at, at least in the tech industry, will have, you know, be able to read through the marketing speech and say on their resume, does this look like someone that I wanna have a further conversation with. And then there would be a set of conversations where they dive into that. Like, okay, tell me about what it's like to be a peer reviewed scientific communicator, right? What, what does that mean? And then you go into, here's how this leads to the um, projects. One thing, one way around that is, um, is to add the, add the public, add the output as kind of proof of it, but not assume that someone not familiar with academia knows what that output implies so that you know like you are a proven um proven product product uh, project manager right you can manage a technical project right what that means is you can take a complex concept that doesn't exist you can break it down into a set of tasks and you can uh do each of those tasks and then you can put it back together into a final product right that's what that's what you do when you do a research project right when you know, you're proving a theorem, you 
have to have to work through all the steps and then package it back up for publication, right? I'm sorry, but the part where that doesn't exist is both key and absolutely hilarious. That's perfect. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's true, right? And it's it's the same things that you know if, if I'm building a new application, um, say to to manage data transfers from one warehouse to another, right? I, it doesn't exist. I have to be able to envision it, break it down into steps, design it, put it all back together. So, I, and you know, maybe platonically it does exist. I, I don't know, but it, it doesn't. It hasn't been written down yet. It's not known to be, to be known yet. So, the, having proved a theorem means that you know a big theorem or or publish something means that you know how to do all that. And as somebody coming out of you know as as somebody who has done the same thing. You know, I'm not a strong mathematician, I, I don't think, but I, I have done math. I know what it means that, that you can prove a theorem, right? But my hiring manager, you know, my, my manager who is a software architect and ha has been a software architect for 25 years, doesn't know what proving a theorem means. So it's kind of, it's, there, there's a piece of education here about what are the skills that you pick up, maybe informally, to be able to deliver this academic output that you can take those skills, pick them up and drop them in a business and the same set of skills will start going and you'll be able to, to, to run with it and, and create value for the business. Zhao Hui asks, is there any difference between getting a PhD degree in data science and getting a PhD degree in harmonic analysis in industry? Um, good question. Uh, I think a PhD in data science would open doors, uh, open more doors more quickly at, uh, say, big research labs. Um, I, like a, if you wanted to work at Google Labs or at DeepMind, for example, um, that, that would open more doors, right? Because they're actively engaged in that research conversation. Um, you know, the PhD in data science means that you probably, you've, over the course of it, you know, you've been to NIPS for three years in a row, you've talked to, um, uh, you, you've talked to the people uh, at, at DeepMind. They probably know your face. They've read some of your papers. Um, so it opened doors in that perspective. Um, as far as uh, as far as a kind of data science engineering job in I don't in the trenches, you know, the the kind that 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 I I do or that I'm I'm looking to, um, you know, that that I, my teammates would be doing. Um, I my opinion is not. Um, I I would actually. I would treat them effectively the same because the set of skills that I need uh, is skill, you know, it's, I, I need the uh, project management and transferable skills, right? Um, but the the day-to-day -day skills are, you know, uh, the, are common to both degrees. So, you know, I don't, most, you know, 99%, frankly, of data science jobs don't need a, to know, the details of neural net architecture, right? They don't need to know whether you've done this, uh, you know, uh, whether you've pushed forward the art of, um, you know, Monte Carlo identification of optimal hyperparameters. Most of the time, it's it's a logistic regression, right? Or a um, even finding a interesting pattern in the in the data and reporting it back out to the team. So. Kind of those skills, the ability to get data, clean data, and understand it. That's I think common to all of those PhDs. Did that did that answer your question? Um, I I know I ran my mouth there for a moment. I have a uh, my question is maybe slightly tangential. I think at one point you were kind of talking a little bit about how there's, there's sort of more introspection in industry about, you know, sort of the culture within, you know, say a company or something like that. I think I agree where this is, this is sort of missing from a lot of, you know, academic departments, but I wonder what, like how, how do companies do this sort of cultural introspection? Or, you know, like what, what are they doing that, that somehow Academic departments are missing. 
good question. Um, and, and to be clear, right, I, I just have five years of experience here. I, uh, it's, um, and I, at, at two different companies. So um, I'm, again, scale, right? There's a huge variety of companies. Some will be more authoritarian in, in the kind of hierarchy, strict hierarchy sense. Some are very, um, you know, aggressively flat where there's maybe one leadership team and then 30 people who all report up to them, um, you know, or, or 150 people even where they're, uh, where, um, so a, a huge variety of, of um, experience. I think what prompts these conversations is the existence of management as a career track where there's people who are expected to, their job is to make sure the organization is structured right and the people in the organization are uh, in the right frame of mind, um, having the right incentives to produce and keep the organization alive, keep it running. Um, I think the fact that management from kind of the frontline manager, that, that junior first, first manager position up to an executive level exists as a separate discipline is part of why it it has as a discipline it has to create a language to talk about achieving its goals um, and i think that the existence of that language is what allows organizations to be more or less introspective about the cultures that they're developing um, the hierarchies that they have um, the and and what's what's healthy and what's not so I, that's that's my slightly considered opinion um, and I, I think I think academics have kind of the opposite conception is that everybody it's a department's very flat right we elect the chair out of you know it's or it's your turn to be chair um, you know there's there's no ostensibly no hierarchy other than you know from associate to assistant to full right um, and I, I think that that is can be it, there, there's a lot of ways in which that's positive, right? To, to not have an acknowledged hierarchy is creates a lot of opportunities for people. But I think at the same time, um, any organization will develop a hierarchy. Um, I think that's part of human nature. Uh, and if it's not acknowledged, it will, it will still be there. It will just be silent and, uh, and enforced uh, without without being known to be enforced. And I think that's a trap that, my, my opinion again, is that's a trap that a lot of academic departments can fall into. So that's, that's again, um, and, and to, to be clear, I'm not a management theorist and I'm not a management expert. This is just kind of thoughts that I've had of you know, watching organizations grow and develop um, and, and thinking, kind of trying to, to, to ponder. So it, it's not, fully informed um, and I am not, I, I don't want it to come across as, as certain, you know, I'm, if, if you draw a management theory practice Dunning-Kruger curve, I'm like, not in the, not in the asymptotic piece. That's probably better suited for sipping drinks and at, at a happy hour than, uh, <laughs> than, you know, answering authoritative questions at a at a lecture, but for take it for what it's worth and take it with salt. All right. Does anybody anybody have any other other questions before we wrap it up for the day? Right. So if not, let's maybe thank you all once more. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.